Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. This week, MasterChef The Professionals, Close to the Enemy, Black British History and the Christmas TV ads. Well, it must be Christmas. The big shops are spending a fortune on CGI and the rights to famous songs in order to get us to spend more money on things we don't really need, like presents and food. People always used to say the adverts are better than the programmes, but that was before the programmes got better. So let's see. Twas the night before Christmas. Carrot gazed at the sky, thinking I could meet Santa when he gets his mince pie. Britain's fifth biggest chain, Aldi, remains very much an outlier when it comes to the annual battle for the hearts and wallets of the seasonally vulnerable, but they did well to hire national treasure Jim Broadbent to narrate their underpowered living carrots fable. And the sleigh flew much faster that cold Christmas Eve, powered on by a carrot, we like to believe. So our hero saves Christmas by being abducted and used as bait for a reindeer. That's not very nice, is it? If Aldi's agency was really clever, their ad would be an almost identical copy of one produced by the big high street supermarkets, but cheaper. little Waitrose girl also leaves a mince pie out, but for a robin. The common passerines against all odds journey home is uniquely prosaic and corporeal among this year's ads. No mythic gift givers or flying sleighs, just a non-anthropomorphic bird and a girl. I admire it for that. There's even a hint of reincarnation for Easter. Marks and Spencer played the celebrity card hard, with Dame in all but name, Janet McTeer as Mrs Christmas, delivering one present as if she's in a milk tray ad. I find this hard to warm to. It's beneath McTeer, the sibling rivalry on Tante Cordiale is unconvincing, and at the end of the day it explicitly links love to consumer goods possibly made in a Chinese factory. Oh, thank you so much, Jake. You might think I don't like my sister very much, but I do. Not sure what these colour-coded yetis are saying about Argos, that their products are abominable. What's this? What's this? There's colour everywhere. What's this? There's white things in the air. What's this? I can't believe my eyes. I must be dreaming. Wake up, Jack. This is unfair. Shouldn't they be queuing up in a foul temper, waiting for a youth to bring them a box from around the back? The John Lewis ad seems to have captured the national imagination and annoyed nature charities with its bouncing wildlife. I follow the night. One day I'll fly Under pressure, like all the big shops, to stop advertising in newspapers that peddle hate speech, and with operating profits down by 31.2% for the last quarter, John Lewis must be praying that their fortunes bounce back. For me, the outright winner is Waitrose, and not just because they do free coffee for my Waitrose cardholders, an offer whose days are surely numbered, with their operating profits down 28.9%. It's triumphant because while the John Lewis humans, though admirably diverse, are perplexed... <coughs> the Waitrose girl, who doesn't know that processed pastry is bad for Robins, seems as enchanted as we are. Never mind factory food, let's have some good, honest restaurant cooking. It's too heavy on cream, far too much parsley, and the refinements of the shallot chopping, the garlic crushed with the skin still on, and the mushrooms, it's just not good enough. It's a very poor sauce, in my opinion. Ouch. And a very poor steak.
Marcus Waring giving out a few tips there. As a lifelong fan of MasterChef, I used to be wary of MasterChef The Professionals, now in its ninth series, as I couldn't see the schadenfreude in trained chefs competing with other trained chefs. But it's actually fascinating, as they come from all corners of the service industry, and not all of them think they're on The Apprentice. I've got to a point in my life where I've been put in the shadows and now it's my time to shine. Now it's my time to rise above the rest and show what I can actually do. Yeah, yeah, we've heard it all before. You want to push yourself in the kitchen, you'll give it 110%. Though not as instantly fluffy as civilian MasterChef or celebrity MasterChef, the pros has an added bonus. The little silent movies acted out by the judges. Beautifully choreographed, discerningly edited. But as four sets of six are reduced down like a human source to 12, then six, then four, then one, the real key ingredient is Greg Wallace. I know some suffer from Wallace intolerance, but I think without his unglazed interjections and Ardman animated gurning, the show will be a lot less entertaining. You want the pan to just come down in temperature just a touch, otherwise the shallots will burn. Ah! I'm never ever going to tire of that. I just love that. Yeah! I'm desperate for him to do really well in the next round. I've had nothing to eat. I had hardly any fish and no velouté. I'm starving. And you had to admire him for trying to get in a David Bowie lyric. And that's all you've got. Room for one more helping of pan-fried criticism on a bed of wilted insults? The ingredients that you've chosen, they're not very well cooked. The rhubarb's just very sharp and tangy. The kale is just slightly overcooked. The celery echo is quite excited about your method of cookery. It hasn't really worked. I don't like the sauce at all. Knives out, BBC bashers. There's a new hashtag in town. Now, BBC Two looks back at a thousand years of black and British history as David Olashoga introduces the first instalment of his major new series. The BBC risks accusations of nationalism and tokenism by branding November black and British. Being black and British or not to be a hashtag issue, but it clearly is. And as part of this corrective, British Nigerian historian David Oilasuga's forgotten history sought to look even further back than the current casting crisis for black British actors. It's time to tell the history of Britain in black as well as white. The genial, eloquent Olasoga's pedometer-punishing, plaque-mounting journey looked at familiar history from an unfamiliar angle. Starting with the early 14th century map of the world, the Mapa Mundi. So to us, everything about this map is wrong. The series is all about life as it was experienced, whether by African Roman centurions or black Georgians, so a little bit of personal context was welcome. I first came here to Hadrian's Wall on a school trip when I was a boy, and back then pretty much everything I knew about Roman Britain came from books like this, from Ladybird books. This is Julius Caesar and Roman Britain, an adventure from history. I'm not sure this latest batch of Ladybird books is as funny as the ones about husbands and wives and sheds. I knew that Rome was in Italy, so I think I must have presumed that the Romans were Italians. But what seemed obvious, and what books like this seemed to make clear, was that there can't have been anybody back in Roman Britain who looked like me or my family. I've read the criticism in the right-wing newspapers that this series is everything that's box-tickingly wrong with the BBC, but I disrespectfully disagree. It's informative, enlightening, and in light of current global shifts to the alt-right, it's a pretty vital warning from history. But what the Romans weren't is racist. Lionised British dramatist Stephen Polyakov, whose last lauded drama for the BBC, Dancing on the Edge, was about a black British jazz band in the 1930s, is not my cup of tea, but I vowed to give his new one, set after the war, a chance. So... You've seen the little girl? Yes. I've done your babysitting for you. Good. I know you're meant to be going on leave this week and it's very overdue, so this is not an order. But I want you to do a little more babysitting of a rather more important kind instead. Well, who do you want me to babysit? The father. And the little girl, of course. The best thing I can say about a Polyakov is that you always know you're watching a Polyakov. And at a time when so much British drama could have been written by anyone, that's bracing. But nothing in his work breathes for me. It's just decent actors declaiming stuff that nobody says. Where on earth did you get that? 
I must be the only toffee apples in London. <laughs> Its locations look smart enough, with bomb-ravaged London, played by Liverpool, but it's the theatrical way they all speak that bothers me, and you can't blame the director, because that's Polyakov too. I assume he actually instructed Jim Sturgis to do an impression of Sean Connery. Yes, you must be Ringwood. Indeed, that's me, sir. Do you want me to call somebody to help you with your luggage? Well, I hardly think that's necessary. <laughs> I gave up at around 15 minutes. Perhaps he'll go the whole hog and cast this actor in his next one. He'd fit right in. A smooth, distinctive flavour that brims with genuine depth and substance. Your moment of zen comes from Planet Earth 2, a series whose only misstep is not to have used the Duran Duran song as its theme. Here are some bears scratching. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Thanks for watching. The item on the coffee table this week was a treasured family photograph from the Collins family archive. Me, my mum, my dad, my sister Melissa and Noel Edmonds. Ah. While you're here, please subscribe to UKTV and please visit UKTV Play and watch some comedy from Dave, a documentary from yesterday, some real life from really or, well, some drama from drama. Or rewatch last week's Teleaddict. It was a good one. <laughs>